All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Guy McPherson here, and I am very excited to have as my guest today, Brad Watts. Brad, welcome. Thanks, Guy. Thanks for having me. All right. So Brad is a licensed professional counselor and certified sex offender treatment provider. He specializes in working with individuals and families where sibling sexual abuse has occurred. His recent book is just out, Sibling Sexual Abuse, a Guide for Confronting America's Silent Epidemic. Brad conducts trainings with communities and groups on how to recognize and respond to incidents of sibling sexual abuse. He's helped hundreds of people on their journey to healing following sibling sexual abuse. All right, man. Uh, again, thank you for for being here. And as I said, um, yeah, I mean, there's no two ways about it. This is this is a very intense topic. Um, before we go there, first, let me just ask you uh, share with our listeners where you're from and where you're calling from, and then let's uh, dive in. Yeah, I'm uh, living in, in Richmond, Virginia. You know, originally from Knoxville, Tennessee. So we've been up here working for you know for the last five years. Okay. Okay. Well, let's start out. How how did you get into this this field and this specialization? Yeah, that's a great question. So it starts probably about nine or ten years ago. I was in graduate school in Tennessee, and I had a professor during one of those classes that talked about her work with uh, adolescent sex offenders. And I remember sitting there in class thinking oh my gosh, that is the one population I could never work with. And thinking, how in the world did she do this? And so thoughts rolling through my mind were like, they may try to offend on her, you know, what was going on and those kinds of things. But she, she had a great impact on me. And she just talked about it over and over again, just glowingly about that kind of work and how much she enjoyed it. And I remember going through conversations uh, with her about that. And, you know, she really fascinated um, with, with why you, you know, youth uh, sexually offend and, and things that, that go along with that. So fast forward to us, we moved up from Tennessee, like I said, five years ago, and I was looking for a job. And, uh, you know, I interviewed, you know, where I'm at now. And they said, you know, we'd love to have you, but how do you feel about working with our, we call it the TSA population here, treatment for sexual or sexually acting out youth. And I remember thinking, I don't know, but I was like, my professor loved it and, you know, I'll give it a shot. And I, I just fell in love with the work. And, and as you said, it's, it's so difficult. Um, but well, let, me, I, let, me, let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. So initially, initially when, when your professor was like excited about working with the population yeah. and you said, I could never do that. Why did you feel that way? Well, I, I think like a lot of us, we have stigmas, things come into, come into our mind. You know, back then, when I thought about sexual offending, you don't think about kids or teenagers. You think about, or for me anyway, I think Jerry Sandusky. I mm -hmm. think, you know, the, the old quote, kind of creepy, you know, old man that you were told to be aware, you know, I remember as a kid being like, be, be afraid of the guy in the white man who's your crowd molesters out there. <laughs> right. And, you know, that was just always, uh, what came to mind. And, White man. I remember them to say, right. um, you know, the, the cases and the trial and, and you know, going through those things. And that's what I always had in mind. I was just like, I just don't think I could ever be, work with somebody as a therapist and give everything that I have to give um, with someone who hurts kids. Mm -hmm. And so as, as I got involved, you know, you really see in, in the trauma aspect, it was a big portion that, the adolescents that offend are so much different than adults. And, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we, we can look at brain development and the differences between adults who have, I'll use Sandusky as an example, you know, set patterns um, where kids, you know, their brains are changing. The prefrontal cortex hasn't fully developed. Um, you know, as they get into treatment, they have just exceedingly high success rates. Mm -hmm. So, According to, to recent studies, we're looking somewhere between 95 and 98 percent of kids that receive treatment of adolescents or receive treatment uh, for sexual offending won't be arrested again for, for offending, won't, won't fall back into that. And in my time here, I've just seen a lot of success. And, and it's so gratifying for parents to come in with, with this just, as I call it the book, an absolute epidemic, um, and then seeing what can take place as families buy in, as kids buy in, and as they do the hard work and treatment, 
and that they, they do change. And, you know, my message in the book is, is as difficult as it is and what survivors go through and, and everything that happens, but there is hope and families can heal um, and families can be put back together even after something is, is, and I can't think of anything worse that could happen to someone and particularly within a family. Um, but my message is there's hope and, you know, outlines the steps and, and every case is different. You know, I understand that but a general roadmap that families can take. Before. Okay, just a couple of things here. So for those who aren't aware, uh, Jeffrey Sandusky was the uh, Penn State football, assistant football coach for, for many years. Um, and also we're talking specifically about, and correct me if I'm wrong here, sibling sexual abuse. That's right. Okay, now you said, um, you know, there's a difference uh, between, you know, an adult and a, and a teen. One of those differences is the brain development. Right. Talk about what, what did you mean specifically by that? Yeah. Yeah. So, so kids, yeah, their kids are adolescents, you know, that, that are treated for sibling sexual abuse. A lot of times they're not thinking through a lot of different things like consequences or what they're doing to their family. Um, they don't fully realize, you know, what's going on. Uh, pornography plays a big, big part in this. And so you're talking underdeveloped brains. That they get hooked on pornography usually early. You know, that average age that a, a, a kid will, or a boy will look at, will search out pornography is the age of 10. Uh, and so you think about that. You're, you're looking at porn, you're thinking, this is manhood. This is sex. This is, is in essence, you know, what I should be kind of thing. This is mm. cool. And so it just messes with these kids' brains. And so then they start looking around and being like, okay, I want to act out, you know, the, these sexual urges that I have. And so, the, well, I can't think of anybody at school that will have sex with me. And so I can force one of my siblings and that they likely won't tell. And so what I find over and over and over again is that they come into treatment and it really hits them. Uh, they, they understand the full scope of what's happened. And once they do, then, you know, they, they have this kind of uh, epiphany in a lot of ways of, I can't believe I've hurt my family to that level. Mm -hmm. And it's a result not to do it again. So are, are you saying that the majority or at least some of the in, these teens who are... Um, doing this is is this the kind of an sound you're making it sound almost like it's a natural unfolding of being addicted to pornography or 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 is there something is this kind of an aber, aberrant behavior or are they the same thing yeah so obviously there's lots of factors that, that go into that you know there's other factors that we talk about and we know everybody looks at porn it doesn't mean you're going to sexually so other, other factors that go into that are their own victimization, where so many of these kids, and we talk about the trauma piece, so many of these kids have been sexually abused themselves. And so that plays a big role. And do we know what percentage, roughly speaking? No, we, we don't. don't. Because so few disclose that. Right. Um, what is your guess? Is it 90%? Well, I think it's a lot less. I, I, would, go, I would go a lot less than that. And I, I would say maybe I don't know, somewhere between 50 and 60%. And what I see more and more is with the rise of technology, with the rise of, you know, we, we can go back to the nineties, like a high speed internet and all the different forms that pornography comes and the more deviant forms, pornography is having the biggest role in kids and their sexual offending. So, so some of the other aspects that, that we have, even if it doesn't, you know, go to the point where they sexually offend, we do know it changes their attitudes towards women mm -hmm. and it changes, you know, it does make them more likely to, to offend sexually as they get more and more involved in pornography. And for example, let's say that they start at 10 or 11 and they're going up to 14, 15 and you know, what that can do within the brain, distorting, you know, their level of arousal, um, you know, the different effects where, um, you know, due to dopamine receptors, you know, being fried in the brain and uh, through the, the increase of pornography where they're needing to, to go to more deviant kinds of forms of behavior. 
uh, your riskier kinds of forms of behavior to get that same level of dopamine kick coming um, that they used to get just from looking at, you know, we could call it regular porn, um, but we see where they take more and more chances. So that can be, you know, what they're doing as far as abusing the sibling. That could be, I'm going to go meet somebody I talked to online, um, out somewhere, which could be really risky. It could be sending new pictures uh, to people that they, they text. So that there's a, a wide array of things that go on, but, you know, it's, those patterns haven't formed you know, with adolescents. So for example, you and I can talk about things, you know, when we were younger that we did, that were like, that was crazy. Right. You know, why did I, why did I do that? And as, as information comes, the treatment comes, you know, our brain forms, uh, you know, develops more, you know, we're more set that it's really hard to break uh, adults with years of patterns of sexually offending where adolescents are much more responsive to treatment. So adults, it's more about containing them and protecting the community. With adolescents, it's more about rehabilitation. With adults, you you, you know you said it, it's 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 different. It's much different. One of the reasons why is the brain development. And with the with what is going on with the adults, generally speaking? Well, they have their their form patterns. And a lot of them will tell you, and I don't work specifically with adults, but research and, and you know different things and people I've talked to have things that they'll talk about that work with them is, you know, and, and I think we've all kind of heard stories. If you if you let me out there, I'm gonna keep doing this. Mm -hmm. We do know from certain studies, the average pedophile, if he's not caught, can have as many as 800 victims. So you look at people like Larry Nasser, who had, I think 350, you know, somewhere in, in that range, that came forward. And, and there's probably many others you know, that didn't. Obviously, Nasser being the, the former Olympic uh, gymnast uh, at Michigan State that had a set pattern. So his pattern was, I'm going to give these girls physicals, tell them that it's physicals. I'm using my position as a trusted doctor to exploit them and to abuse for years and years. Uh, what we see with adolescents is they don't take the same level of risk Adolescents will, will, or adults will be much riskier with their behavior. Uh, adolescents typically aren't going to go outside of the home or outside of someone that they, they know, uh, you know, where they, they can sit and, and try and control the environment. So with sibling sexual abuse, it's, I can use my relationship with my younger brother or sister to, to say things like, well, you don't want me to go away. You don't want, want me to get in trouble. They know their interests. They can bribe them into silence or bribe them into, into sexual activity. So it's those kinds of things, but those patterns that due to their brain and, and their ability to, to kind of change and as new information comes, they're engaging in treatment, they can learn and develop and, and, and see the, the full impact of what they're doing and then you know, you know make those changes. So those are some of the things I see anyway. Yeah, man, uh, as, as these teens, and I, I, I know it's hard to make generalizations here, but as these teens grow older, are they able to understand the impact they're having? That, that's what I see, yes. And, and so sometimes it comes down like a ton of bricks uh, as, as they see it. It's obviously mm. coming in, there, there's a level of defensiveness, uh, a lot of obviously, you know, secrecy, um, trying to keep their, their, everything a secret, that kind of stuff. And, and we do a lot of work as far as empathy, trying to understand the abuse from their, their siblings perspective, trying to understand from their parents. Family therapy is a very important piece of this and having the, the family really involved to understand the family's perspective and understanding, look, you have, in essence, trust is a bridge. You have torched that thing. Mm -hmm. through your behavior and it takes time and experience and effort and it's at your family's at their pace of things with this trauma that they've, they've gone through that trust can be restored and everybody's different you know as far as bringing that back in but it's being accountable for that understanding what's what they have done and just the impact of that and so we spend a lot of time you know with that and you know taking ownership of it and, and that helps you know, with them and their development as well. So in the book, 
again, just uh, want to reintroduce you. I'm speaking with Brad Watts. Uh, the book is called Sibling Sexual Abuse, A Guide for Confronting America's Silent Epidemic. Um, I'll have this linked up here at the traumatherapistpodcast.com. Where can people get this book? Amazon. Okay. Right Go on Amazon um, right there. You know, and I've got it really, you know, okay. you don't want to get many people, as many people's hands as possible. This is something we don't talk about. Right, right. Now, in the title of the book, you say it's an epidemic. Yeah. What exactly does that mean? Okay. It means it's so prevalent, but yet we never talk about it. So, it's, you know, I wrote the book, in essence, just because with my work here, my work with families, there's nothing like it. There's nothing that they can turn to. So, and I found within, gosh, my circles of people, even within my sphere of influence, how prevalent this is. So I would go out in the community and just do presentations on, on some of this stuff. And I would always have lots of people come up to me and kind of sharing their story or, or things like that. And you know, I was thinking, we never talk about this. It's just never talked about. So as a parent, if I find out that happens in, within my family, well, what do you do? Right. Well, I can go on Facebook and say, hey, where do you go to find a, a good therapist or, or resources when, when one of my kids is sexually abused the other one? And so it's just, we just, it's one of those rare, rare things in our culture and society now that is completely taboo to talk about. And so it's just the prevalence of that and just wanting to, to give a voice to it. Um, so many people, yeah, you know, gosh, all these survivors, all the things that they go through into adulthood, and we see it's generational, it just kind of continues on. And I just feel like if we talked about it more, if it was part of the discourse and more acceptable to talk about it, as difficult as it is, that we could really alleviate a lot of the suffering um, that goes on. Parents would be more willing, instead of trying to hide it, right. you know, going to sources where we can get help, where survivors can get the treatment that they need, where, where offenders can go and get in, in the, the sex offender treatment that can rehabilitate them and families can get the treatment that they need as parents. Um, so I just think we should we should be able to talk about that. The epidemic is we're not, it's so prevalent that we, we turn a blind eye. To. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes I think about my questions to, and I think that they're, they're, that's not a good question, but I want to ask this anyway. Are there signs that yeah. are there telltale signs that this is going on in a family? Yeah, yeah. And it, this is similar to, to just other forms of abuse, you know, that we see. You know, if you make your kid, you know, ang you know, rages of anger, you know, problems eating, problems sleeping, nightmares, changes in behavior are a big thing. Are we talking about the, the perpetrator or the victim? Or no, I'm talking about survivors. Okay, yeah, survivors. Yeah, yeah, survivors that you're seeing out of them. Uh, similar kinds of things you can see from, from um, the offending sibling as far as you know, secrecy and behavior. Are they acting differently? Um, a lot of times you know, they're hiding things from you. So maybe you're looking at things and, and you know, there's things being hidden. Um, you know, different things along those lines. Some are just really good at hiding it. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so sibling sexual abuse happens in dysfunctional families, but it happens also in very highly functioning families. It happens across every kind of spectrum you could think of, you know, no, no matter your race, economic status, it doesn't matter. You know, it affects all of this. And that's why we talk about, I said America in the book, but what I've really found is that this is a worldwide mm -hmm. kind of so can you give us an example, Brad, of how you work? Obviously, you know, we, we want to re retain confidentiality, but give us an example. Do you work individually? Do you work in groups? Do people seem to respond better in groups, group therapy? I do both. And groups are amazing. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, groups are, are so important. And, you know, for the offenders that, that are that are in and, and you know, holding each other accountable and the same kinds of things in other areas, you know, whether it's, I've done substance abuse groups, same kinds of things. And I see some of the, the greatest growth come from those groups. I think, you know, ideally for parents that, you know, that's happened in your family and it's so devastating and shattering. Mm -hmm. If they could be in groups doing therapy with other parents where that, that has happened, that would be an immense, 
commits benefit help to them as well. Uh, but yeah, groups are very effective and, and family therapy is very effective too. So are there such groups like that where families get together? Uh, not that I know of. Huh. Um, I, I don't, it's something I, I want to, you know, that's something I want to create. That's you cool. know, that's very interesting because it reminds me of uh, where I was working previously uh, in Northern California at a facility uh, where we assessed uh, and treated young kids who were showing early signs of psychosis. And we worked a lot, very successfully with families and family yeah. members and bringing them in there. And that was crucial because they got to see that other family and other parents were going through the same thing. Um, but I, I kind of want to drill down a little bit. So you, how do you work with someone? You get a call, they come in, what do you do specifically? So I work in a residential uh, treatment facility. And, and so kids come in, you know, some come from charges, you know, legal charges for the judge. And then I talk about this in the book. Sometimes they'll dictate, you have to go and, and receive inpatient treatment. Um, sometimes it's just parents, you know, kind of referring, you know, over being like, hey, I, I need to, to uh, you know, get the child help. And, and so they're, they're all, over the, all over the map, you know, as far as, Fences that have gone on. Sometimes it's people are trending that way. You know, there's there's some some signs going on, and so localities or families are trying to, to get their, their kid in uh, to get treatment. So uh, so those are, are some of the main ways that we mm -hmm. uh, right and, you know, clients I work with. And when you're, I mean, I, again, I'm sure this is all across the board, but I'm just curious when someone's coming in to see you, when a kid is coming. You now we're talking mostly male. Fenders? Yeah, so so our where I work, it, it's straight up males. Okay, it's, it's just all all boys that, that we work with, and so the numbers that we see, there are female offenders, as we know, and and so some of the most recent stats are there's about seven percent of females uh, that, that do sexually offend, and that, but ninety three percent of them of, of the numbers that we have are, are males that commit sibling sexual abuse. I'm curious about when they come in to see you. I mean, are they just very defensive or I mean, again, I'm not sure this is all across the board, but yeah. what, what's it, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this for uh, just short of five years. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a ton that come in that are defensive that will just straight up deny it. Then you have others that are like, Hey, you know, like we see in other, you know, uh, areas, um, with counseling, uh, and the others are like, "Yeah, I, I need, I need help," and are, are different areas on the map. But yeah, I, I'd say a good majority are uh, defensive. You know, when they first come in. Right, right. Now, what have you learned about yourself having done this now for almost five years? You know, you started out, you're like, "No freaking way, am I going to work with these this population?" Now here you are, you've written a book. Yeah, you know, it, it's. How I view people and circumstances is totally changed. And my, my feeling of hope has just increased exponentially. And the value of, of every, every person that, you know, people that I personally, I have judged, you know, partially. Um, and, and I think we do because of the nature of the offense, uh, of the offending, of the abuse but that people can change and everybody's got a story mm -hmm. and, and it, it changes how I just interact with, with people I come across with on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, I haven't walked in somebody's shoes and there are people, there's so many of these kids that I've worked with horrible trauma histories and the importance of addressing that trauma as part of their rehabilitation, but also holding them accountable. You know, it, it's lots and lots and lots of people you know, or sexually abused or look at porn that don't go out and offend on others. And so it's that protection and that safety um, that I feel like we're facilitating as we re rehabilitate, as we care for survivors, as we care for families. Um, I, you know, it's just hopeful and just wanting people to, to, to know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're here to, to support. There are avenues. And just because this happens in your family as horrific as it is, doesn't mean you can't put your family back together. It doesn't mean you can't heal because you can heal from it. Yeah, that 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 word hope, I mean, is just so crucial 
And uh, it, it was equally as important where I was working with those kids who'd shown early signs of psychosis. Um, oftentimes, you know, that's another uh, area where people are like psychosis. No, we can't talk about that. It's too crazy. It's freaky. Something's wrong. But what you're talking about here and just, I mean, I just really appreciate you and how you're coming at this and, and uh, with such empathy and such hope. I mean, that is crucial and that goes such a long way for, for individuals, for kids, for, for families too. Um, has, has this been, or how has this been challenging for you personally? Well, you know, I mean, you know, obviously you learn as you do this, right? You know, with, with other things and uh, you just at different points, um, you know, really using like in, in my own case, I think ineffective treatment, you know, approaches and things. So, so with, within the field, you know, particularly back in the eighties and it's carried on and it, it's still out there, but really ineffective ways to handle it. So therapists would use very highly aggressive kind of confrontational approaches, you know, because they felt like that, that's what worked. And I know I've done that with certain people and it's just gone bad. Mm. You know? And I found as I work more as a collaborator with families, with these kids and, you know, tweaking, you know, what I'm doing, trying, trying to build, you know, pro-social skills, trying to build, you know, protective factors, trying to help them understand you know, empathy, trying to, you know, addressing their trauma has been a big, big thing as we, we address their trauma. You know, we, we see that they do much better as well. And then helping them learn healthy, consensual sexual, you know, health understanding, you know, what it means, building confidence in them to be able to establish consensual, healthy relationships and not just trying to scare them that I can never talk to a male or female or whatever their preference is, because I'm an offender and I'll never get past that, but helping them know that, that they can change. And so I've, I've made plenty of mistakes, you know, and then with each one, I try and learn and be a better therapist from it. Awesome. All right. So as we wind down here, um, I mean, in addition to your book, and we'll come back to that, what other book recommendations uh, would you would you share with us? You know, whether abuse related or not. Yeah. Uh, one of the books that I really enjoy, and uh, we've talked a lot about pornography, but it's Your Brain on Porn by Gary Wilson. And you know, he's got a great TED talk on that. He talks about how porn affects the brain and talks about some of the things that I had outlined about, you know, how it affects dopamine receptors and leads to, to more and more kind of deviant behavior and some of the, the, the benefits and the health benefits that go on in the adolescent brain as they remove themselves mm. from porn. And so that's been instrumental. Um, it's probably at the top of the list. Uh, it's not a book, but Dr. James Worling has, has a lot of research on this um, and treatment and, and different things, very hopeful, uh, a lot of statistics. Um, and, you know, his work, it, it really motivated me, you know, to, to delve into this further. And, and um, so, yeah, I mean, th those are some of the, the things that have inspired me, some of the men that have inspired me on this. James Worley? Worley. Worley. W-O-R-L-I-N-G. I see. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, once again, the book is Sibling Sexual Abuse, A Guide for Confronting America's Silent Epidemic. So, you know, Therapists of all kinds are listening out there, counselors, whatever, whomever. Um, aside from your book and these other resources, are there particular courses, workshops, or classes that teach this stuff? You know, I'm not, I'm not aware of a lot of classes, you know, out there. I think that that's one of the problems is we just don't have enough out wow. there. I mean, personally, you know, I have things in my mind that I want to, after the book, you know, go and, and you know, those are goals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it very well can be some stuff out there. Um, it's just not a lot. Okay. It's okay. just, it's not much because we don't talk about it. Right. Much with, with sibling sexual abuse specifically. Right, right. The need. All right, Brad. Well, man, congratulations on the book and, uh, and also congratulations on the amazing work you're doing. I mean, we need people like you out there, seriously. And I appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. Thanks, guy. I really appreciate that. Thank All you. right, man. Take care. You too. See you.